here this morning. Worship the Lord. If you'll turn with me to the book of Psalms, the 91st Psalm. Are you aware that there are no chapters in the book of Psalms? Because it's a collection of songs and poems. It's not a chronological book. Most of the Bible is not written chronologically. Anyhow, one of the assignments I had, there were a few classes in Bible school that I didn't enjoy. Uh, mainly because I didn't like the assignment. And uh, one of them was when Brother Crozier taught Jeremiah. Brother Crozier was a very highly educated man, uh, 12 or 13 years of higher education, multiple degree uh, degrees, and he was a great man, very methodical and very, uh, a really good guy. Uh, but he, one of the assignment was that we were to read the book of Jeremiah, and put it in chronological order. Now, had I been smart, I could have found a commentary to do that for me, but instead I had someone else do the assignment for me. And uh, Brother Crozier said to me, it is amazing that your dissertation, and I thought the God released him and made some variations, but he didn't say, your dissertation is exactly the same as this other brother's. And I said, I guess great minds think alike. And uh, he left it at that. but. Uh, that's just my little pet peeve about the book of Psalms. Psalms 91, verse 1. He that dwelleth in the secret place of the Most High shall abide under the shadow of the Almighty. And I will say of the Lord, He is my refuge and my fortress, my God in whom, in Him will I trust. Will you turn with me to the book of Matthew, chapter 6. Matthew, chapter 6, and verse Five. Jesus said this, and when thou prayest, thou shalt not be as the hypocrites are, for they love to pray standing in the synagogues and in the corners of the streets that they may be seen of men. Verily I say unto you, they have their reward. But when thou prayest, enter into the closet, and when thou hast shut thy door, pray to the Father which is in secret. The Father who is in secret. And he says, And thy Father which seeth in secret shall reward thee openly. How does he reward thee openly? He rewards you with an effective and an anointed life and ministry. Now, <clears throat> David said here, He who dwells. In the Hebrew it means to lodge. He who <laughs> lodges or lives in the secret place of the Most High God. There are a few things that uh, I hear Christians say that are totally unbelievable. One is that it's hard to be a Christian. That's not what the Scripture says. The scripture says the way of the transgressor is hard. Jesus said, All ye that labor and are heavy laden, come unto me and I will give you rest, for my yoke is easy and my burden is light. What's hard is when we try to hang on to the world. Another thing that uh, I hear people say, they, they've said, they'll say, oh, that person is so heavy in mind, they're no earthly good. Wrong. Wrong. If you're truly a spiritual person, in the biblical sense of the word, you are worth much to this world, but rarely will you be appreciated for it. Amen. Yeah. They didn't appreciate Jesus, did they? And they were real kind to Isaiah, were they not? And to Jeremiah. They did good to Peter. Thomas in India, we don't know from biblical accounts, but we hear by tradition, they just loved on him there. And it did happen that way. So what is this secret place? It is a resting place where one passes the night. you got to remember that much of the, the Bible is, is, well, it's all set in a Middle Eastern setting, but it's in a Bedouin mindset, in an Arab shepherd type of mindset. And this dwelling place was a place to spend the night. It was a safe and secure place. Might have even been an oasis. He who, he who finds a place to rest, who finds his home in the secret place of the Most High God, it denotes nearness to God, and it denotes our interpersonal relationship with Him. So who is this that can enter into the secret place of the Most High God? Well, in Psalm 24, 
the psalmist writes and he says, Who shall ascend into the hill of the Lord, and who shall stand in his holy place? He that hath clean hands and a pure heart. Uh-oh. There's a disqualifier. I feel disqualified already. Mm. Who hath not lifted up his soul unto vanity, nor sworn deceitfully. He shall receive the blessing from the Lord and righteousness from the God of look at the next phrase, of his salvation. This is the generation of them that seek him, that seek thy face, O Jacob, Salem. Lift up your heads, O ye gates, and be ye lifted up the everlasting doors, and the King of glory shall come in. So who shall ascend up to the holy hill of God? He who has clean hands and a pure heart. Well, that's a problem. It's a problem for me because my hands aren't always clean. My heart is not always pure. But look what he also says in here. He talks about, in verse 5, and righteousness from the God of his salvation. It's not based on my performance that gains me entrance into the holy place or into the secret place of the Most High God. It's on the performance of Jesus Christ. I stand complete and washed in him. Who makes my hands clean? It's the finished work of Jesus Christ. Jesus makes my hands clean. He makes me fit to enter into the presence of God. Who purifies my heart? It's Jesus. Now, if there's something about sanctification, it's both instantaneous and it's progressive. Instantaneous, the moment you're saved, you've been sanctified, blood washed, you are clean as you stand before the Lord because he sees you through Jesus. And the progressive part is that growing and ever becoming more like him in our walk and in our talk and in our living. So, some might think today, I, I'm not worthy enough to enter into his secret place. Well, you're right, you're not. But Jesus is. And you're going in covered under the blood and under the person of Jesus Christ. He brings, he's the great reconciler. All the mighty gulf that God did span, where? At Calvary. He spanned that gulf. He, he's our way of entrance. He brings me into this holy place, this this uh, secret place of the Most High God. Only Jesus' blood can cleanse us. Who can enter into this secret place? Those who are drawn. In John chapter 6, Jesus said, No man comes to me except the Father which has sent me draw him, and I will raise him up at the last day. No man comes to the Father except by me. And Jesus said that also. We are drawn to this place. Long before you were saved, the Holy Spirit was dealing with your heart. Rarely have I heard of, and it's possible, and it probably does happen, but people hear the gospel for the first time and right away give their heart to the Lord. I know it was a drawing. I, I can tell you the day that I went to the altar. I can give you that date. I look back at a calendar of April of 1977. It was Palm Sunday. And I'll tell you, he was dealing with me long before that. He was drawing me. He was calling me. He was, he was pulling me to himself. Every man and woman, every boy and girl, that has ever lived in this world, whether they were from the Western Hemisphere or from the Eastern Hemisphere, whether they were red, yellow, black, brown, blue, orange, or white, all have been drawn by the Holy Spirit. We've heard stories of missionaries that when they reach tribes that have never been reached before, and they begin to tell them about Jesus and the mercy of God and, and the gift of Jesus, that many times the natives said, we've been praying to that God for years, but we didn't know what his name was. How can that be? Because the Holy Spirit is drawing them. And the Holy Spirit draws us into fellowship <coughs> with the Father in this secret place. Now, you might think, well, this, this special secret place of God is for the all-stars of Christians, for the superstars of Christians. There is no all-stars, and there is no superstars. There is only one star, 
And he refers to himself in Revelation as the bright and morning star. He is Jesus. He is sprung on high. There's a new light in the world. Who is that? It's Jesus. It's Emmanuel, God with us. There are no superstars. The little old grandma in her prayer closet has as much access to God through Jesus as does the renowned world evangelist. It's amazing uh, how, how unknown, unnamed, unrecognized Christians have such a powerful force in the prayer closet because they've touched God and God has touched them. He who dwells in the secret place of the Most High God, practicing God's presence, entertaining God. Why would God want to be entertained by me or hosted by me? It's because he loves me. What is man that thou art so mindful of him? Tell you what it is about man. We are his, his heart and his treasure. Let me tell you something. Uh, this is a sidebar. We won't charge for this. Are you ready for this? God loves you so much. And he wants to include you so much. Do you know what he has done? He's adopted you as his sons and daughters. And we will... And we, we, are, we are heirs and joint heirs together with Jesus Christ, each and every one of you, that's blood washed by the Lamb of God. He's my Savior, He's my Lord, He's my King, He's my God, but He's my brother. Chosen. Little boy came home from school one day in tears, and he said to his mother, you don't love me the way Billy's mother loves him. She said, well, that's not true. He said, uh-huh. He said, Billy told me. He said, see, I was born into your family. You didn't choose me. Billy was chosen. He was adopted. Let me tell you what great love the Father hath toward us in that he would send his son to die for and it's more than just being saved. He wants to have an intimate, personal relationship with each and every one of us. With you. But you don't know me. I'm not worthy. So what? Neither am I. Let me, let me tell you something. There's bones in every closet. Okay? If you smell my feet in the morning, you won't want to be around me either. Huh? There's enough to go around. The stake of sin is everywhere, but the blood of Jesus has cleansed me. Come into his fold. Come into the secret place of the Most High God. Don't worry about not being worthy. Accept the worthiness that Christ has wrought for you at Calvary. So he draws people. And he draws people even after they're saved. There are some people that rarely come into the secret place of the Most High God. We come into it in our public worship here, in our corporate worship. I love to worship corporately. I love to, there's something special about being together and being in the presence of God. But there's also that <clears throat> intimate personal time uh, alone with God. People say, well, I'm a very busy person. I don't have time for that. Yes, you do. Yeah, you do. Come on. You do have time. That secret place can suddenly appear as you're driving down the road. Now don't get so lost in God that you get slain in the spirit while you're driving because that can be problematic. How about it? it could be that, that moment when you're sitting at work and suddenly the Holy Spirit comes to fellowship. You sense his presence. People said to me, what is the presence of God? How do I know when I'm in it? Well, the best way to describe it is it's a profound sense of peace and joy and love. At times it is a restfulness at times for me it's a heaviness heavy in my spirit because the Lord is sharing a burden with me and I might not recognize it you know that for years I thought that I was I was depressed and here it was the Lord was trying to pull me into the burden of the Lord and feel that burden you know most of our issues in the in the human condition are not necessarily emotional or physical 
uh, there's some physical, but not necessarily emotion, emotional or mental, but the vast majority of them is spiritual. I've seen people in the psychiatric ward of hospitals that when I left visiting them, I met them for the first time, there's somebody who would say, go visit that person for me. Okay, I'll do that. And when I left and I got home, I said to Kitty, I'll tell you something, I don't think that person's ever going to be able to function. And that was just the, they were, I, I've been with people that were almost canatonic. They didn't respond. But when you get up to leave, they, they, they put up a fuss. They didn't want you to leave. And I remember two such ladies. And one Sunday, the, the, the lady, her sister was a lovely member in our church, a school teacher. She had me go visit her sister. She's going to spend the rest of her life in the mental hospitals. That's what I thought. And one Sunday, as uh, I was greeting people coming in the door, I guess who came in with a great big smile on their face and hugged my neck. She said, thank you for visiting me in the hospital. You're welcome. I wanted to say, I didn't even know you knew I was there. And another lady, God help her. But I'll tell you what, you know at the end of the story that lady was? We dedicated her baby to the Lord. Thank God. What a wonderful thing God can do if we respond and we come into his presence and we lay out before him all our cares, all our burdens. You know what it means to cast your care upon the Lord? It means you give every burden and every care to him and then you leave it to him to take care of the need. And every time I feel like I need to pick that back up again or worry or fear hurts my fear often hurts my heart. I go back before the Lord and I lay there before God until that burden is lifted again. Turn to the book of Song of Solomon, or as Solomon called it, Song of Songs. The story of the Song of Solomon is, is a love, it's a picture, an allegory of the love relationship between Jesus Christ and members of his church. But in Song of Solomon 1.4, the Shulamite says about her king, her, her uh, husband, she says, draw me, we will run after thee. The king hath brought me into his chambers. We will be glad and rejoice in thee. We will remember thy love more than wine. The upright love thee. So who can come into the secret place of the Most High God? Those that are drawn by him. Draw me. Bring me into the, the secret place, to the inner chambers. Bring me into that, that private place where I can commune with you and you can commune with me. I love Fanny Crosby. And uh, she wrote in her hymn, I am thine, O Lord. She said, Oh, the purity light of a single hour that before thy throne I spend. When I kneel in prayer with thee, my God, I commune as friend with friend. Wow. He no longer calls you servants. He calls you friends. You're his friend. Do you believe that today? Draw me. See, sometimes God wants us to pray. Draw me to you. In Song of Solomon, chapter 2, verse 4. He brought me to his banqueting house, and his banner over me was love. <coughs> this secret place is a place of love. It's a place uh, when we're drawn, we have great personal benefits from having been in his presence. Who's in the secret place? Those who desire. Song of Solomon, we'll go back to the first chapter again, verse 7. Tell me, this is what she's saying, uh, tell to her, her uh, to her king, shepherd here, tell me, O thou whom my soul lovest, where thou feedest and where thou makest thy flock to rest at noon, for why should I be as one that turneth aside by the flocks of thy companions? Tell me. I desire to be with you. Jesus. <coughs> never is, never a moment waiting on God is wasted. You know, if you, what does the scripture say? That if you seek him, you shall find him. Seek and ye shall find. Knock, and it shall be opened. Ask, and ye shall receive. 
but it's also for those that respond. Again, in Song of Solomon, chapter 5, verse 2. I slept, but my heart wakened. It is the voice of my beloved that knocketh, saying, Open to me, my sister, my love, my dove, my undefiled, for my head is filled with dew, and my locks with the drops of the night. And then this is what she said. She has some excuses. She said, I put off my coat. How shall I put it on? See, he came at an inconvenient time for her. She was ready to go to bed. She already took off her coat. She was in her nightwear. I have washed my feet. How shall I defile them? I can't come outside. I've already had my bath. My beloved put his hand by the hole of the door. My bowels were moved for him. She stirred, but she doesn't take action. You know, music and worship music is a wonderful thing. But we have to be careful that it doesn't just stir our soul, but reaches our spirit. Because music can be a very soulish thing. And Jesus said, they that worship God must worship him in spirit and in truth. And sometimes, nowadays, I look at some worship and I say to myself, it seems kind of soulish to me. I don't want to judge unless I'm there, but I don't need the lights in the fall. Uh, I don't need the, the, the show, so to speak. But boy, I want to come into his presence. I want the smoke of God to be the fog in the room, the glory of God. She said, I, and then finally she gets up. She said, I rose up to open to my beloved, and my hands dropped with myrrh, my fingers with sweet-smelling myrrh upon the handles of the logs. I opened to my beloved, but my be beloved hath withdrawn himself. Seek the Lord while he may be found. Call upon him while he is yet near. And sometimes we can miss God. God's been drawing us, but we get, you know. Did you ever, uh, I don't know if this has ever happened. Did you ever take your glasses off? 30 seconds later, you don't know where you laid them down. You ever put your cell phone somewhere and turn right around and can't find it? That never happens to me, does it, Kitty? All the time. All the time. I am easily distracted. You feel the tug of God on my heart and I can say, you know what, I'm going to go in the room. I'm going to spend some time alone with God. Hey, wait a minute, is that a monkey on TV? I'm going to watch this monkey just for a few minutes. See, I'm the kind of guy that I can turn the channel on the TV and then say to myself 30 seconds later, what was I just watching? I can't remember because I'm so easily distracted. And what happened to her is she had all these excuses and she missed the tug of God on her heart to come and to be alone with her, uh, with her lover here and have an intimate personal time. She missed that. She said, I rose up. To open to my beloved, my hands dropped with myrrh, my fingers the sweet smelling of myrrh, upon the handles of my locks. I open to my beloved, but my beloved hath withdrawn himself and was gone. My soul failed when he spake. That she said, I missed the opportunity. Now thank God it would come back again to her. I sought him, but I could not find him. I called him, but he gave no answer. Ah, it's okay. Ah, that's one on me. If I miss it this time, I'll get it the next time. Many a time later in the same day, I've said to myself, boy, oh boy, I wish I would have missed God this morning because now I'm into it up to my waiters and I don't know which way to turn. And this is what she said. The watchmen that went about the city <coughs> They smote me. They wounded me. The keepers of the walls took away my veil from me. Listen, when she missed the opportunity that God was calling her aside, later she suffered because of it. Now, she wasn't killed. She wasn't totally banished or rejected forever. It was a learning lesson to respond to the promptings of God. There are times that you may say, God can meet me back here as my really rationalized. And I don't think I'm going to. I haven't read my Bible in a day or so. I, I, 
catch up on what we do. And begin to try on the inside. He calls us. Those who desire, those who respond, those who have a clean hands and a pure heart. The secret place, as we said, is a place of intimacy. It's the nearness of God. Ron Mayo, Pastor Ron Mayo, he's passed away now, he had leukemia, but he said, the nearness of God makes anything in life endurable. So when I come into that intimate place of fellowship with him, as I'm communing with him and he with me, he gives me the ability to be able to endure and to keep plotting on. How many times a day do I say, I can't do this? I can't do this anymore. Is anyone else at that stage in your life that when you get up out of a seated chair, you can do it without making noise? I groan. My knee pops. I've had, I love these young kids that were 20 something. Is that your knee? Is your knee's pop? Or as you're walking, your knee gives out. I love when I've been married longer than these kids have been on earth, and I love when they say to me, Are you all right? Do you need help? Well, you're not going to be able to help me because I'm too big. You're going to have to get you and a couple of other of your friends if you think you can help me. Huh? I can't do this. But there is a God who says that I can. It's a place where we hear God's voice. And his glory is revealed unto us. Be still and know that I am God. In John chapter 14, <clears throat> pardon me, verse 21, Jesus said, He that hath my commandments and keepeth them, he it is that loveth me. And he that loveth me shall be loved of my Father, and I will love him, and I will manifest myself to him. It's in this secret place where we have the manifestation of Jesus, the manifestation of God. Judas saith unto him, Not Iscariot, Lord, how is it that thou wilt manifest thyself unto us and not unto the world? And Jesus said, If a man love me, he will keep my words, and my Father will love him, and we will come unto him and make our abode with him. We will live with him. We will live in him. We will surround him. Remember, Jesus it says in the book of Acts, that in him we live and move and have our being. We are people who practice the presence of God. Now the carnal man will never understand all of that. The carnal Christian won't. They're the ones that will say, you're so earthly, you're so heavenly minded, you're no earthly good. Ishmael will always war against Isaac. Always. The flesh will always war against the spirit. Going back to being enabled, I can do all things through Christ with strength and strength. Amen. You know, there's a, a picture that I saw on social media, and it was about, I think it was like three or four kittens, the top pain. Have you seen this one? And the kittens are going into a room, and it says, me entering the prayer closet. And the bottom pain, there are four or five lions coming out of the room. And it says, me coming out of the prayer closet. For by thee I can run through a troop and leap over a wall. If God can give courage to Gideon, God can give courage and strength to me. If David with a shepherd's sling and five smooth stones can go out into the battlefield all alone, trusting in the Lord, he did not fear or dread, but by faith he saw what? The victory ahead. What gave David the confidence to stand up against that ungodly Philistine. What gave David the confidence to tear the lion and the bear with his bare hands? What gave Jesus the confidence to say, Father, if it possible, let this come past me. Nevertheless, not my will, but thy will be done. Because Jesus was often in the secret place of the Most High God. It's a place of refinement. In 1 John chapter 3, now, some people think that this is only talking about when Jesus comes in his second coming. It's not. The participle here, it's a present tense participle, but it says in 1 John 3, 2, Beloved, now are we the sons of God, 
and it doth not yet appear what we shall be, but we know that when he shall appear, we shall be like him, for we shall see him as he is. What happens in the secret place of the Most High God is a transformation and a refinement because when he shines the light of his glory upon us, we become like him. He reveals himself to us. The secret place of the Most High is where we learn to move and flow with the Holy Spirit. I used to tell new converts, when you have your devotions, when you get before God, have church, sing, worship, read the scripture, pray, flow in the Spirit. That's where you learn to move and flow in the Holy Spirit. Get before God and bear your heart. Pour out your heart before the Lord. Wait upon Him. You've been baptized in the Holy Spirit. Speak in tongues. Sing in tongues. There's also times where you just groan. You know, the Spirit itself maketh intercession. We don't, we don't always know how to pray as we ought, but the Spirit Himself maketh intercession for us with groanings which cannot be uttered. It's not talking about speaking in tongues there. It's talking about groanings. You ever feel like the weight of the world is on you and you don't know why? Take that and bear that before the Lord. And then back to Psalm 91 again. We have the testimony of those who dwell in the secret place of the Most High God. He says, he says here that I will say of the Lord, He is my refuge. The name of the Lord is a strong tower. The righteous run to it and are safe. He's a refuge in the time of storm. He's the cleft of the rock. When the winds are howling, when the devil is, is barking, I run to the rock that is higher than I. You read that throughout the Psalms. Hear my cry, O God, attend unto my prayer. From the ends of the earth will I cry unto thee. When my heart is overwhelmed, Lead me to the rock that is higher than I. For thou hast been a shelter for me and a strong tower from the enemy. Psalm 61. Did you ever read these verses of Scripture back to God in your prayer? He's a refuge. He's a fortress. The enemy's coming after me, but guess what? I'm going to get inside the gates of the fort before he does, and we're going to slam the door shut. Let him try to scale that wall. My Savior will pick him right off the top of it. He's my God in whom I trust. I love the story of Thomas. Jesus appeared to his disciples several times after his resurrection. Thomas wasn't there. They told Thomas the story. He said, unless I see the nail prints in his hands, unless I touch the wound in his side, Boys, I just don't think I can believe. This is beyond my ability to comprehend or accept. It sounds good, and I'm not saying you're liars, but buddy, I'm struggling with this one. And what did Jesus do? He appeared when Thomas was there. And he says, Thomas, come here. Put your hand in here. Thomas, come here. Put your hand in here. And what did Thomas say? My Lord and my God. Hallelujah. Wow. To be able to get to the place where we say, my God, my God, you're here. No evil shall befall thee. We read, we'll read down through here in closing. Uh, Surely he shall deliver thee from the snare of the fowler and from the noise, noisome pestilence. He shall cover thee with his feathers under his wings. You ever sing that hymn? And under his wings shalt thou trust. His truth shall be thy shield and buckler. Thou shalt not be afraid of the terror by night, nor for the arrow that fly, flieth by day, nor for the pestilence that walketh in darkness, nor for the destruction that wasteth at noonday. I will tell you, there's times I have fear. I'm afraid what might happen. I tell that to you. I've said to her on many occasions over the years, what's going to happen? 
we don't have to fear. A thousand shall fall by thy side and ten thousand at thy right hand, but it shall not come nigh unto thee. Only with thine eyes shall thou behold and see the reward of the wicked. Because thou hast made the Lord, which is my refuge, even the Most High, thy habitation, there shall no evil befall thee, neither shall any plague come nigh unto thy dwelling, for he shall give his angels charge over thee. Beyond our vision to see, there is a spiritual world. I don't know, I don't know if I have a special angel assigned to me. But I know he shall give his angels charge over me. And boy, there are times that I have sensed the divine protection of God. Neither shall any plague come nigh into thy dwelling, for his angels shall have charge over thee to keep thee in all thy ways. They shall bear thee up in thy hands, lest thou dash thy feet against the stone. I like to we'll jump down to verse 15. Because he calleth upon me, I will answer. Want to know what the other advantage of the secret place is? You have the ear of the creator of all the universe. How many times have you said to a loved one, or maybe you would like to have said to a business associate or a customer, are you hearing me? Is it passing through the ears, getting through that gray matter and getting deep into the brain? God always hears us. When we're in the secret place, he hears us. When my mother died, we were we we, we lived with our, we lived with my mom and we were pastoring a church. It, it really it was we had moved in with mom between churches, but then my mom became ill, and really now mom was living with us. And my wife took care of my mother. She had had colon cancer, but she had gotten better through the operation. But the radiation treatments were just horrible to her. She became very weak. She eventually regained her strength. And he really nursed her when she came home. But uh, you know, we were pastoring a small church working in a shoe factory. We had mom's retirement help with the uh, expenses there. But my mother died. I didn't want the future. I didn't know if I'd be able to maintain that house. The kitty wasn't working. Our kids were all small. We had three small children under the age of five or six years old. I wasn't sure. And I was grief stricken. I had lost my dad, I told you before, when I was 13, and that hurt. But let me tell you something there's no hurting like the hurt you feel when you lose your mama. God bless you. It is tough. And we buried her the Friday before Mother's Day. That Saturday morning, I, all this happens so quickly that, you know, you wake up before your eyes even open, you're conscious. And the sun came through the window behind our bed. I could feel the sunlight, and I heard deep within my spirit, no evil shall befall me. That's the love of God. If you make God your holy habitation, if you enter into the secret place of the Most High, He will care for you and keep you. The final chapter has not been written on our lives. I don't know what the future holds, and I don't need to know what the future holds. Sometimes people say, I'd like to have answers. I don't want answers because when I get an answer, it only leads to more questions. I want peace. He is the Prince of Peace. We celebrate this time of year. Uh, peace, the Prince of Peace coming into the world. You see, when he gives peace, I'm at rest, and I don't need the answers because I can trust him who holds my hand. Many things about tomorrow I don't seem to understand, but it doesn't matter. Because if I enter into the secret place of the Most High God, he's my refuge, my fortress, He's my God who is trustworthy, and I can trust him. No evil will befall me, and at any time, he's ready to listen to me. I don't dictate to God what he should do and when he should do it, but I can sure pour out my heart 
And he just may say to me, well, my grace is sufficient for me. In weakness, I will make you strong. Or he may say, consider it done. But we live in his presence. You see, God wants to have fellowship with you. God wants to have fellowship with each Christian. He wants that intimate, personal relationship. It's something that needs to be cultivated. Something that needs to be practiced. And even this morning, what does Jesus say in Revelation? Behold, I stand at the door and knock. If any man will open unto me, I will come in unto him, and I will sup with him, and he will sup with me. You don't have to be a Harvard graduate. Doesn't matter if you are. You don't have to be a world-renowned evangelist. You don't have to, you, you don't even have to know how to list all the books of the Bible from Genesis to Revelation. Unless I sing that song, it's a little hard for me to. I start to mumble some of it. He's calling you, and he's here today, and he's knocking on the door of your heart, and he's saying, open unto me, open up, let me in, I'll take care of everything. Doesn't mean we don't go through stormy times, but it's a lot better to go through him who pilots the ship, huh? What happened to the disciples when he sent them away? That day, and he stayed up in the mountains to pray. They ended up out on the lake, out in the Sea of Galilee, and a storm blew up suddenly, and the winds were contrary to them. They were toilsome. It seemed as if they would row 10 feet and they would be blown back another 15 or 20. They were in quite a predicament. And what does the scripture say? Jesus was on top of the mountain watching them. And what did he do? He came to them in the midst of their storm. And he waited for them to say, hey, come here. And that's what he's doing today. He's knocking on the heart's door of each person in this sanctuary. You say, I don't know a whole lot about the Bible. You don't. Know. You come into the secret place of the Most High. You say, I have failed him many times. Who hasn't? I'm overcoming your objections. Remember I told you, I used to teach sales effectiveness. I can overcome your objections. Who hasn't? It's not my faithfulness that matters. It's the faithfulness of Jesus Christ. You say, I don't have time. Yes, you do. You live and move and have your being in his presence. You're driving to work suddenly turn that radio off and you just commune as friend with friend. It's when you're doing the dishes or vacuuming the carpet. It's when you're sitting alone in your living room or you're in your bedroom in the middle of the night you wake up you sense the presence of God there. That's, a, that, that's your Savior making time to be with you. He who dwells in the secret places of his eye shall abide under the shadow of the Almighty. And I will say of the Lord, He is my refuge, my fortress, my God in whom I will trust. Say to you, come and hear this Hallelujah. Will you bow your heads just for a moment today? Hallelujah. Hallelujah. I want to read to you Fanny Crosby's hymn again. <clears throat> She had a unique ability to touch the heart of God. Okay. Bookmark out. Give me one moment, please. The first stanza, Ms. Crosby writes this. I 
I am thine, O Lord. I have heard thy voice, and it spoke thy love to me. While I long to rise in the arms of faith and be closer drawn to thee. Draw me near. Draw me near. That's what we want to ask God to do for us today. Consecrate me now to thy service, Lord, by the power of grace divine. Let my soul look up with a steadfast hope, and my will be lost in thine. Oh, the pure delight of a single hour that before thy throne I spend, when I kneel in prayer with thee, my God, I commune as friend with friend. Believe God speaking to our hearts today. Will you stand? And we're going to open the altar while Sister Sandy plays. Will you come and commune with your friend today? Will you come and commune with your Savior, your Lord? Come and commune with him who is your brother because you've been adopted through the blood of Jesus Christ. Hallelujah. We are growing today. Huh?